Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Scottish Independence Podcast. I'm Fiona McGregor from the Indie Life Podcast team and with my team member Marlene Halliday, we're going to be sharing an episode of our Indie Jigsaw show. In this week's edition, we're talking to some seasoned activists and campaigners to see what we can learn, what skills we can sharpen up for that all-important independence referendum. So we hope you find this one very useful as well as enjoyable. Welcome everyone to another of our Indie Jigsaw shows and this one is all about campaigning. We've called it Campaign 101, Getting Our Point Across. Yes, we've got a nice mixture of guests this month. From the, the grassroots campaigning end, we have a veteran of the poll tax campaign, Frances Curran, and she's going to be telling us about her Power to the People campaign. Frances was an MSP for the uh, Scottish mm. Socialist Party, wasn't she? And after, after we talk to Frances, we're going to be talking to Grant Toms. I was going to say he's an academic, but that's maybe not completely fair to him either, but he's uh, a professional lobbyist, um, mm. an independent supporter. He was invited to talk to Glasgow Pensioners for Independence. Um, you and I were in that meeting and we asked him a few questions. So we're going to show a bit of that meeting. We we'll also have a look at some campaign resources and Commonweal have just set up a campaign centre. So we have a look at that with Leo Plum from Commonweal. And then finally, we take a look into the abyss and <laughs> we look at how Rob Shorthouse claims to have won the 2014 Vote. Of course, it may not have been him who won it, but they certainly won. And I wouldn't just, be admitting it. <laughs> I, I mean, that is an eye opener. When you found that clip, and when I watched it, I thought, "Wow, that's an eye opener about how to run a ruthless campaign." Yeah. And, and that's it. I mean, you, you question the morality of it, but you can't question the focus in the organisation. So yeah. we'll save that to the end. So yeah. keep watching till the end. <laughs> On the 12th of August, there was a demo by the new campaign group Power to the People. It was outside Scottish Power's offices. An enthusiastic crowd were demanding freeze prices, not people, and singing a little verse or two of a campaign song, which you might remember if you were around in the 70s and 80s, like we were. Power to the People, which is a new grassroots campaign getting going to address the current uh, energy cost crisis. And Francis Curran is very much part of that campaign. And if you'd like to watch that footage, you'll get it on our Indie Live Extra YouTube channel. So let's go over to Francis now. And we asked her how she'd gone about creating this campaign. So if you're going to build a campaign, the thing is, the energy market's a shambles. It's an absolute dysfunctional market. It's a wash with public money. And every time something goes wrong and there's difficulties, then they just adjust it and they make it up. It's mm. not a proper market. It's got billions of pounds of public money in it. And so well, what's happening internationally and, and the price of, of gas, then we know that this isn't going to be resolved quickly. Mm. And if anything, the companies are just trying to manoeuvre themselves to continue to both make more profit and get public money to save them. This is not going to be a short campaign. So when you're in for the long haul, we're in for a year, two years down the line, defending people against what, what the companies want to do to them. So you have to also build a camp. That's going to take a really big campaign, a grassroots campaign. We need thousands and thousands of people to be involved in this campaign. Mm -hmm. And so you need to organise action like the Scottish Power demonstration in order to bring people together and begin to get a wider and wider circle of people who get involved in the campaign. And so it was real though, we want to meet Scottish Power. In fact, we've already met them in the cafe. We came across the road to chat to us when we were setting up the yeah. project. The day before we'd gone for a recce, because we had a bit of kind of shooting and we had with, with the PA work, where should we hold it? And I had security outside it, because a few groups had been inside that week. So we just, I went up to the security guy and said, listen, we're not here today and we're just here to do a recce for the protest tomorrow. We got an email the next day saying, can we meet you? And we said, yeah, all right then. And we thought, well, it's the security coming to meet us. And then we got, we got um, the guy who's liaison with the government and the PR woman. And then we went into the energy market. And, and I'm like, 
you didn't know the people we thought we were going to meet. <laughs> and what they came yeah. here is that they wanted to discuss with us about a price freeze because oh. their boss, Keith Anderson, had already proposed this in April. And why did they propose it? Because they're terrified of what's going to happen next. And they're afraid, one, of the anger that it's going to provoke. But they're also afraid that if, with the price cap on, that they're not going to be able to pay dividends or profits to their shareholders. Remember, that's who he, he's interested in on his £1.15 million salary. And so it became quite an interesting discussion. We raised prepayment meters, we raised late fees and all that yeah. sort of stuff for them as well. Yeah. The bit where you cross the road into the front, did you plan that? It looked as if somebody just thought, right, that's it, we're crossing the road and off you went. Yeah, what, what happened is STV came up to us and said, we would like a shot of you over there um, and crossing the roads. And if you don't do it soon, you're going to miss the six o'clock news. <laughs> so I had the megaphone and I was like, right, okay, then yeah, why not? I'm not going to do it. Uh, but yeah, we just said, right, okay, we're going now, so let's just go. No, it was totally impromptu. But what was interesting about it is once we got across the road, we were going to come back. And the protesters just decided, no, nah, we're staying. We weren't coming back. They were going to stay outside Scottish Power. So I just went back over the road and we set up the stage. And so it's, it was all very spontaneous. There was a bit of singing, there was some chants, there was dancing at one point. You know, there was an element of fun about it, as well as what seems to be kind of rising anger, at, rightly so, I think, of um, the way people's lives are being affected by a lot of the, the policies we're dealing with just now. It did feel very sort of old school grassroots in it. You mentioned, um, I think, on the stage that you'd been part of the poll tax protests and you'd helped bring down Thatcher. Um, you know, the world of social media and everything is very, very different to what it was back then. Yeah. Not paying your poll tax perhaps has less of an immediate impact on people than not paying your electricity bill. Can you use approaches that you used back then now or is it different? The key question. I think there's two lessons from the anti-poll tax movement. One is the character of the campaign. It was totally grassroots. Every anti-poll tax union was set up, well, first in Scotland, because it was introduced for the first year, and then in England. And they were set up in the image of the people who lived in that community. So the Glasgow ones were different from the Murray ones, the Edinburgh ones were different from the Dumfries ones, and the West End Glasgow one was very different for the Eastern House one. So they were all very, very different. And they did different things as well, how they engaged people, but they had that kind of autonomy. We had a national strategy and we had ways of clogging up the courts and stopping the sheriff's officers coming in in each community. But it was adaptable to a grassroots level. And I think this campaign has to look like that. I think it has to be grassroots. Committees need to be set up in every community that we can across the whole of Scotland because that's your, it's your neighbours you're talking to. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the people that you see every week at, in uh, Morrison's for me or at the bus stop in the morning when you're going to work. And so two things happen with that. One, you can do that information exchange of how you, this has come up, what do you think? And the other thing is you can um, feel that solidarity because people are not sitting at home with their poll tax bill or in this case their energy bill and their debt and just being like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What yeah. am I going to do? Yeah. There's this huge movement that is supportive and also tells you not to be ashamed of debt. We're taught to be ashamed of debt. Banks are never ashamed. They borrow mm -hmm. billions and then go bankrupt and then don't pay their loans and they like that. That's entrepreneurialism. But if ordinary people are in debt, oh, that's, that's terrible. You can't manage your finances and you should be ashamed. It's the grassroots bit of that movement that challenges that and makes people feel powerful instead of feeling as if they're isolated. Presumably also within that grassroots approach, people can help one another. People can say, well, yeah, if someone's feeling anxious or, you know, so worried and everything, you know, help them to get the information, help them along to Citizens Advice Bureau, you know, just get things yeah. going. Because as you say, it's sitting at home being isolated. That's the worst thing of all, isn't it? And well, I, I mean, sometimes in those situations, people end up, you know, doing themselves harm. And Mental health crises yeah. of this, this yeah. energy bills in particular, is going to be huge. When actually getting involved in a campaign, enormously benefits loads of people's mental health yeah. because instead of feeling powerless you feel as if you've got some power and yeah. you can join yeah. up with other people it's brilliant yeah. i mean 
we, I saw people were dead gallus in the anti-poll tax campaign. And, and quite rightly so. I mean, a lot of the meetings we did, you'd have, I don't know, say 30 people in a meeting in a community centre. Probably when you went in, most of them were afraid, were scared, they weren't sure if they were not going to pay or not. And they had to be convinced. And what convinced them was that collective. And even when they left the meeting, we still weren't sure they were convinced. Because people weigh up, they, 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 they take time to decide whether or not they're going to take part in this campaign. And the role of the campaign is, and, and the people who are forefront in it, is to give confidence to people. That if they take this stand, they're not, not going to be alone. In fact, they're going to make about 200 new pals if they are in their area, if they actually decide to do this. That's a leap, but you need a campaign to do it. And that's why the Scottish Power protest is so important and the other things that we're going to organise, because it gives people that confidence about the collective. Most of the very positive responses, I have to say, people say, good on you, wish I'd known it was coming and all that. But then a couple of people going, why are you doing this here? Why aren't you protesting at Holyrood? And a couple saying, why aren't you protesting at Westminster? And what you've just explained there about the power of being part of a grassroots campaign, it isn't particularly about where you're doing it, it's about who you're doing it with, isn't it? And that sort of solidarity is, is the bit that the jigsaw they're missing. It's interesting with the, with energy, just it's another one of these things where actually does the power lie to fix things? Is it the energy providers? Is it off gem? Clearly not. Is it Holyrood? Is it Westminster? Well, the energy system in this country is a total shambles from beginning to end. So all of those people have got a stake in it. So the energy companies, they just want to make profit for the shareholders. That's it. That's the bottom line. And that's who they're answerable to. So going to Scottish Power, their shareholders have had, last year, the, the big five made £7.7 .7 billion pounds and they paid it dividends. So protesting against Scottish Power is part of the campaign. The energy companies are not getting off the hook. They could implement a price freeze, open the books. What reserves do they have? They should have been putting money away for a rainy day instead of giving it to the... Their shareholders are the richest people in the world. Every year they make more and more and more money, no matter how much we pay. So we were saying to them, you need to take the hit. The other thing about Scottish Power was we want the um, late fees cancelled. It's money for nothing. Yeah. £10, yeah. £20, pound, £33, yeah. pound, £95. Yeah. And, and, and handing over a debt collector. It's an industry. Yeah. Yeah. And so we want them cancelled and we actually think we can win that. And the other thing is we want no forced prepayment meters. And we also want a lower tariff on the prepayment yeah, meters. So absolutely. we've got yeah. three demands and two of them immediately Scottish Power as a company could implement tomorrow. So that was one of the reasons we went to Scottish Power. But I think you're right, Holyrood is a bit of a different kettle of fish because energy isn't devolved. And I'm not letting the Scottish Government off the, the hook because they've not come out and said they're in favour of price freeze. One of the areas where the Scottish Government can intervene, and it'll come to this, but at the moment we're concentrating on a price freeze on the 1st of October, is when it comes to debt because loads of areas of debt are devolved and we want the Scottish Government to use their powers to protect ordinary people against big companies who are chasing them for money, which is a multi-million pound industry, just ripping people off with no getting enough money. And there's a guy called Alan McIntosh and he's written a bill called the Cost of Living Debt Scotland Bill and it's got about eight points in it and we want the Scottish Parliament to pass them. It's things about wage arrestments, bank arrestments, how much money you can keep, whether people can come in your house and take your goods away. There's loads of things like that. Yeah. So, so we want them to pass that. Well, it's going to happen anyway, but we're going to get to that stage. If, if you're going to intervene in this at all from the point of view of Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP, then that's the place to that's intervene place to protect to do people. It, yeah. And then we'll be able to see whether they're in the side of the big companies mm. or they're going to be in the side of the people. So we would go to Holyrood for that. And as for Westminster, I mean, is there any point going there anyway? <laughs> I mean, seriously? Well, at this stage, they're not going to listen. I think what's going to make Westminster sit up and listen is if there's protest across the country. Yeah. Instead of going to Westminster, we need mass protest. We need pensioners to protest. We need young people to protest. We need women to protest. We need everybody to come onto the street. And I can't, will that happen before the 1st of October? I think in Scotland, we'll be able to bring pressure to bear. And Ofgem is the next one, which will have taken place by the time the show goes out. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, they're a total joke. I mean, they really are a joke. Every single decision that they've had to take on green subsidies, on profits, on 
and charges, all of that on prepayment meters. It's just in the pockets of the companies. They're not independent. They do seem to be protecting the interests of the energy companies at the expense of the consumers. Well, the standing charge is a joke. They actually, the power company said to us it's an antiquated charge. And also, we pay more in Scotland than they do in London. It has to be public ownership. I mean, our campaign's in favour of public ownership. Are the Tories going to carry through public ownership? Well, they nationalised the banks when they were in crisis, so who knows? What the energy companies are terrified of is that, that they end up in that type of financial crisis and the government is going to come in and take the keys back because yeah. there's no alternative. I'm in favour of that, by the way. If they can't run energy under these circumstances, then they're getting paid the fortune to do it, then gives them back again. Hopefully there's going to, it's going to be a referendum in just over a year's time and, you know, already a bit of campaigning sort of starting up. And so we just wondered when we've got you here in the studio, just to kind of ask if you think is it the same kind of campaigning that is needed in the second um, ND campaign compared to the first? And, you know, there was lots of great stuff, wasn't there? There was, you know, there were some groups that just really focused on going to chat and doors and getting people to make, get themselves on the electoral roll and get them able to vote. And then there was great public meetings set up, really good speakers came to the fore. Do you think it's going to be the same kind of campaign and we're going to need something a bit different this time? I think that's a really good question. Where's the Yes movement been since in the last eight years? I think there's loads of people who are dying to get campaign. They won't engage. And we've been kind of parked for all that time. And what to do in the meantime. And, and a number of Yes groups have survived. South Glasgow, Cumbernauld, you know, there's a, they yeah. still meet. And they've yeah. they religiously met every month yeah. for eight years. And so total respect to those activists in the movement. But I actually think there's a bit before th that campaign, because strategically, how are we going to get a referendum? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the question that the movement isn't answering at the moment. How are we going to get force either? What is the strategy and the tactics to get us to the stage where we can even have that campaign? And that's what's missing. The good thing about Socialists for Independence is we can work with, talk to um, people in the independence movement who are no socialists, but we can also work with and talk to people who are in the other side of that discussion, but who are socialists or, or who are in the left. And there's an important point here because there's loads of people who are in that other side, don't support yes, but they do support the right of Scotland to determine its own future. So is there ground in the middle there, is there a bridge where the whole of Scotland, not just the Yes campaign, says to the Tories, who are you, posh boys in London, to tell us in Scotland that we're not entitled to decide ourselves? We're Democrats. Mm -hmm. we're, this is the democracy of our country. So I think the campaign that we need to discuss is a mass democracy campaign in Scotland for the right to decide before we even get to that bit where the Yes campaign emerges again. We've not got a massive window for that to take place between now and the court case, which is either going to confirm or deny our right to have a referendum, because that's going to be this October. So do we have time? Well, we don't need time before that Supreme Court case, but it does strike me that wh however that court case, whatever they decide, that's going to be a turning point or, or maybe a, a better way of putting it, a, a tipping point. I mean, mm -hmm. if they come out and say yes, that will clear the way to have a, have a referendum. Um, but if they don't, that's the tipping point for mm -hmm. something of akin to what you're what you're what you're thinking and and i mean yeah there's left you know there's people on the left side of politics who definitely would say it's our right to have it but i i expect there are people on the right of scottish politics who feel the same way they're not going mm -hmm. to probably vote for independence but they're definitely going to support would support it's up to us to make the decision so maybe that would be the tipping point and then how would we get something like that going using the image of a bridge, isn't there? So you can see you've got mm -hmm. a bridge over to the left wing side of the argument. Maybe yeah. we need a few we'll bridges, different kind of groups kind of talking to one another. I think so. But I think it has to be a bit radical. 
if you just leave this discussion to the courts, into Westminster, into Holyrood, then you're excluding the mass of the population in Scotland. And I think we need to involve the mass of the population in Scotland, the people of Scotland, in this democratic right. I mean, there's a whole history of countries who have fought for their right to decide whether they're yeah. independent yeah. or not. And so there's lots of tactics from that. So the reason I think it has to be a bit radical, though, is because I think that the only way you're going to get it, you have to think, what's going to hurt Westminster? What's going to hurt the city of London? <laughs> what's going to really bring pressure to bear? Mass protest, yes, that works. But we need other tactics other than that. And I think that's what we need to discuss. But we need to take it to England as well. Just after the independence referendum, the last time when we'd, we were still in the defeat phase, I went to London with my partner at the time. We were in the, the art galleries. We were in the, I can't remember, it's the National Portrait Gallery. And he was walking around, he's a photographer, and he said, every fourth picture's ours. <laughs> and I thought, wow! Never thought of that. And I was thinking, there's lots of people in England who would support this. And I was thinking, yeah, well, we could go around to not on the paintings, obviously, but saying, you know, we, we, we want to share, but we do you support us? Asking English people, do you support our right? You think yeah. you're Democrats, you're on the world stage. Do you think we've got the right to decide? On things like mass civil disobedience, because I've, I've been talking about this, I've been discussing with people about it, about types of ideas. And I'll just give you one idea. Now, it probably is near gore, but this is the type of thing we need to think about. What if people in Scotland decided to take their money or the banks and put them in credit unions in Scotland? And what if we said, see those credit unions in Scotland, because I know some of the people in credit unions in Scotland, they've got reserves at the moment and they want to invest it in things like social housing, public housing and other things like that. Now, I don't think they've got the ability to do that, you know, the way they're regulated. But let's say we could change that. <clears throat> You've got these big credit unions. Let's take the money at the banks in London. So I think things like that is what we, we would need to think about as a protest. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of other things that we could do. I know people have talked about you no know, paying their TV licence after the last time because of the, as a protest at the coverage of the BBC. But I think there is things that we could discuss that every single citizen of Scotland could participate in collectively to bring pressure to bear just for the right to have a, a democratic referendum but you would need to set up that campaign and yeah. it can just be controlled for the top. I'm sort of thinking what kind of thing could get people out you know out on the street mm. kind of it, I mean a, a lot of it's difficult isn't it because you want to affect London and you want to affect Westminster but but maybe even just things that we could do out on the street just to be I suppose it's being visible, Francis, you know, to get out people out there and then, well, you know, your demonstration last week, there you were, you had STBs talking to you, you had the, the folk from Scottish Power talking to you immediately, because people are out there on the street and mm. I'm just wondering if there's something, I mean, it might just be something as simple as clogging up the streets around George Square in mm -hmm. Glasgow and then the buses can't get through. Now, of course, that would annoy people though. That would annoy some folk who are on the buses. Can you think of other things that would just spark a kind of imagination somewhere and also get picked up by mainstream media? Because that's the point, isn't it? It has to get picked up. Yeah, I think it would have to be visible in the streets. And young people now are dead interested in politics. And they're very um, clued in about their rights, which is it's a good thing. But that idea about it's our rights, this is a democratic right, I think there's a generation who who would be inspired by that, who would feel the injustice of it, and who also would be innovative, you know, they've got TikTok and all that, they would be really <laughs> innovative about the ways that they brought that mass protest or mass visibility to bear. Once you start the campaign, then other people would, you know, people would be engaged in it and, and kind of, and, and feel ownership of it. And I think that's quite an important idea to understand when you're doing a campaign. It's a bit like the climate and school strikes when they didn't go in on a Friday for the climate. It's got massively popular, exactly a kind of cause that you would think we could link in with independence. Brilliant, wasn't it, that campaign? I mean, it's, I mean, okay, so you go on a bus in Glasgow, you expect to speak to a stranger anyway. 
<laughs> even if there's not a campaign. But you're sitting next to a stranger and they turn and say, have you made out your mind yet? And then suddenly, mm -hmm. so then you're in this conversation about the constitutional future of Scotland. <laughs> and that sort of thing was just yeah. fantastic. And it was so, quite soon after, you know, you get the words that started coming in about how it was divisive. Well, I wouldn't say there was no divisions in families and arguments and stuff, but on the whole, as far as I could see, it, it was, mm -hmm. it was, we all talked to one another and you didn't mind if the person you were sitting next to on the bus wasn't going to vote. Yes, well, you might mind, but you know, you could have, you were mm -hmm. engaging with them and there was contact and there was conversation. And I just hope we can get back eventually, you know, to something like that. See, I, mean, I don't think we can. I, I think it's going to be a very different feeling to this campaign because it's very much more polarised now. Instead of 30% in the middle who might or might not go one way or the other, they, that's down to sort of 5 to 10% now. And John Curtis said this, that people have aligned their views on independence largely with their views on Brexit. It's true, but then what Francis is just uh, is just sort of saying, like maybe there's another kind of campaign that we need to get into yeah. first. That actually is less polarised. It's just about being Scottish. That was real grassroots campaigning, wasn't it? It, it? You could just see the link from what Francis had learned from the poll tax episode and getting people out in the streets and that sense of camaraderie, I think, was, was very, very powerful. Yes, it was actually. And it, yeah, it did take you back to, for those of us <laughs> who can have got the memory that goes that far mm. back to that point. I was just also very struck with how she talked about the need to build bridges um, and, and ways of, you know, ways of doing that, but how do you kind of expand your reach so that you're talking to the people that you do actually have to persuade as opposed to us talking to people who are already persuaded? Yeah, and there's common ground. I think that was a phrase she used as well. So although um, there might be people who aren't as persuaded of independence as we are, there is certainly common ground when it comes to, you know, the unfairness of the current energy price. Yeah, I was just very taken with that. And I mean, I, I hope that part of the people campaign, you know, gains momentum. Let's talk to our next guest, who is Grant Toms. Grant Toms, he's currently a part-time lecturer in um, public relations at the uh, University of Stirling and he, and he runs his own um, communications consultancy business and you know he's a professional lobbyist, he's worked at the uh, Scottish Parliament and, and, and elsewhere. A lot of his work is with social enterprises and small businesses and you know helping them, well helping them get their point across to mm. whether it's Holyrood or local authorities. We thought let's get him along and see if we can get an, a, a way in from someone like Grant to talk about campaigning for, for independence. When he talked to us, he was recovering from COVID, about of COVID, yeah, so just because. bear with him because he, he, his voice, it does get a bit croaky. A bit croaky. <laughs> what are the tactics that are most successful when it comes to lobbying? And I'll give you an example. I, I used to be on the board of Friends of Scotland and at an AGM, I think it was about 2012, uh, they had a workshop bit and it was all about lobbying. They got a new kind of, um, they got funding to employ someone who was going to explore Scottish companies that were doing basically fossil fuel exploration, oil exploration in uh, outside Scotland. So they knew enough about what was happening in Scottish waters, but what where were Scotland's oil companies, people like uh, Bowmore and Cairn Energy, what were they doing to exploit the world's resources that we could make them accountable for in Scotland? So, um, you know, good piece of work, good to get the finance and everything. But this guy had this workshop and there's about 40 people in the room. And he said, OK, stood up on a chair and said, if you believe that lobbying is bad, go and stand at that side of the room. If you believe that lobbying is good, go and stand at that side of the room. If you think it's something, you know, you can stand anywhere in the room to show roughly where you are. Well, you've never seen this mass run to the end where lobbying's bad and I'm standing at the other end of the room. Um, and I'm going like, um, excuse me, I'm a lobbyist and I'm on your board. Um, and they're going like, ah, but you're you're lobbying for good. So, you know, I think the um, the reality is, yes, there's a lots of us who are, um, some of them still might not like to be called lobbyists, but I've never had a problem calling myself a lobbyist because I kind of know that's what it's much easier. It sees what it does in the tin. Um, public affairs executive can be interpreted so many different ways for different people. Lobbying or influencing um, is kind of the key to it. And 
the type of stuff that I've done uh, more recently has been with disability employment charities, more on a one-to-one basis, and more of it's around council rather than doing anything on behalf of it, um, an organisation. So the third sector is probably the biggest employer of lobbyists or people who influence in Scotland. If you were to go through the lobbying register of the Scottish Parliament, for every hundred meetings that are logged, I can guarantee you about 70% of them will be from the third sector. And part of that, I think, one, they've got a lot of things they want to campaign on, so it's quite right. Uh, I do think sometimes, though, that I, as a, someone looking at the, the effectiveness of influencing and lobbying, I sometimes think that a lot of people are employed by managers in the third sector, charities, who don't understand what lobbying is. So they get told by their new employee, well, I've got 10 meetings with 10 MSPs coming up and I'm going to meet um, the spokesperson for this and I put in a request for the minister for that. And then it gets all logged out. Oh, that sounds really good. And it's like, but what did your meetings with 10 MSPs ever achieve? What was that about? And is it not just a, a game of having your name in the register 10 times to make it look like you're doing stuff? Um, as opposed to, well, what actually did you ever achieve? That's a lot of time and effort you put into that. How could that resource have been best used? I have recently been working with an alcohol um, charity, uh, not directly with them, again, actually doing mentoring and coaching for a, a new member of staff who's taken on a public affairs role with them. Um, and it was looking at um, what is it that you want to achieve change by? Who is it that you need to communicate with? How have you thought about doing that? What's your message? Um, uh, all of these, you know, these are just standards, um, anything to do with um, any form of professional communication. Mm-hmm. It's always using the basics of um, five W's and H, you know, who, what, why, where, when, and how. I think a lot of people now understand that process, although interestingly enough, even then people do that and then I'll say things like, oh, so what's your message? What is it you're trying to say? And it's like, and they take that as an obvious. And it's like, you've never, at no point in your little plan you've passed on to me, has that stated? There's an objective, that's great, but it's not telling me how you will communicate this objective. Um, and that's the big difference in communication is that you need to think about what we're saying and are we saying it consistently? Um, are we saying it authentically? Um, uh, are we going to get caught out as hypocrites because we're saying this, but actually we're doing something completely different? And I think in tactics-wise as well, uh, it's also looking at how to get more bags for your buck. Now, for your buck, in this sense, it just means resource. Resource can be volunteer time as much as expense on a staff member or paying to do activities. And so what I've tried instilling both of my students and the people um, I've worked with if you've got an objective, how about trying to, to um, create activity or that you may actually achieve more than one objective? Um, so when I watched the Scottish Renewables, my annual plan maybe had six key things I wanted to do, but they were all about trying to tackle different communication objectives within the organisation as we went through the year. So one of them was we tried to, you know, we... Um, Bear in mind, a lot of this was designed when we had something like three wind farms in Scotland. Um, we tried to put wind farms, we tried, we tried to get the wind farm developers and owners to put their uh, premises into Open Door Scotland in September and actually set up a community engagement, public engagement at the wind farm to explain what the wind farm was doing, how it was working, because there was so many myths going on. And said, you know, Open Door is a classic time when you would show that. You might open the bottom of a turbine and let them stick their head in and see how tall it is and how you actually climb up the turbine, that kind of thing. But, you know, you would look at that. So that would serve community engagement, uh, helping people to understand better about wind power and, you know, uh, give out information about how wind power works um, and countering some of the myths about what wind power does or doesn't do. Um, And then you might say, well, if you're doing that, have you invited local key political stakeholders or Um, that if you're maybe going to extend your wind farm or a wind farm that you're creating nearby, why not bring some of the the leaders there to your open day that's only five miles away or ten miles away and let them see at first hand what's happening there? And have you looked at, you know, how you can then publicise this, um, how you can gain media coverage for what you're doing as a way of engaging? So 
in doing that, that hit three of my objectives through one event. I had my political engagement and my community engagement and media coverage, which were different types of objectives in my, in my communication and public affairs plan. And you had to think smartly like that because at that time there was five staff in Scottish Renewables um, and I couldn't deliver for an industry. I had to basically coordinate so that all the member companies were mobilised to do this stuff um, at the same time so that we gave the impression that the industry was responding to these things and was acting as one with a common message, etc. So that's kind of the way that we would we'd, uh, work on that. And most, I'd say most um, Scottish charities in third sector are very professional about this now. Um, because I know because a lot of my graduates are sitting in great jobs in the third sector um, and I bring them back as guest lecturers or on panels to, for the students to help them understand what their job is and how they go about doing that. Yeah, and, and some of the most effective tactics are the lowest resource tactics. They don't cost a lot of money, but they sometimes need a bit of bravado. Um, so again, Friends of the Earth are very good at doing this. If they would, they would um, uh, create, <laughs> well, they'd get their staff and volunteers to dress up, invade the Scottish Power um, annual general meeting, but they were clever. They bought a share, so they had access to the AGM by right. And then they'd go in and then they would, you know, disrupt it and um, make a statement, knowing full well that maybe TV cameras were there, or they'd tip off their favourite environmental correspondents to make sure the cameras were there. Scottish Power thought they were there to cover the AGM and the finances. They were not. They were there to cover the, the disruption that was going to take place. Um, and so from the, you know, being able to go to a second-hand shop and get suits. I remember there was five girls that did this, to get suits. And they, they drew on the little moustaches <laughs> as well, just to really make this point. They got numerous media coverage um, in Scotland and out with it um, for disrupting the Scottish Power AGM and making their point that Scottish Power had to come out of fossil fuels. They had to close Langanet. They had to, you know, decarbonise Peterhead as well. It was like, you know, the, the clear idea of what they were up to, and it made a very powerful uh, message. Now, my students think that they all need big budgets to pay for advertising on Facebook, and it's like, no, you know, you're on a PR degree, not an advertising degree. You can do this with nothing. Um, it's creativity that comes first and foremost. I forget now what, what scandal it was down at Westminster, but they had a dozen guys outside the gates with Boris masks on having a tea party. And those masks probably cost a fiver for the total. And that was on every single news all day. Really superb bit of work. You know, people think of lobbying and public affairs work as something that's about secretly going in to meet the minister. No, it's not. Most of the best public affairs and lobbying campaigns also understand we live in a mediatised society how do you use the media in conjunction with the direct lobbying, activism, campaign work that you're doing as well? Mm. And bring the two together. And that amplifies your message through these media outlets in a way that you can possibly do by standing, or by you know, chanting outside St Andrew's house on your own type thing. So mm. what you do, you amplify it. You look for ways of how to get it done. Now, in the modern age, amplification is done a lot through digital and social media as much as through what's called earned media, the traditional legacy of print broadcast. So it's, it's understanding your media landscape is hugely important as well. But again, it's not rocket science. Um, it's kind of like daunting. I mean, I get scared when I hear about new platforms coming out and, um, oh, you know, for a while it was, oh, you, Gen Z need to only use TikTok for their news. And it's like, <laughs> you know, to, who the hell are Gen Z and what's TikTok? But, you know, I'll, I'll go and learn it because I'm still working. I need to understand these things um, and make sure to understand the terms that they're talking about. Also, get people to justify, you know, how do you know that Gen Z, people who are born since 2000, actually take their news consumption from TikTok? And what do you mean by news consumption? Um, and then when you explore it, it finds out that actually um, the type of news consumption they take from uh, a short form video platform like TikTok is actually coming from legacy news uh, news outlets. So mm -hmm. it's the Sun or the Mail or it's not something like the Scotsman or Herald, I have to say, not even the National. Oh no, the National is actually very good on TikTok. It's their little video clips that they're taking the news from. 
So it's not that the TikTok has a news platform, it's that news providers are using TikTok to get their message to a younger generation. We know that in 2014, one of the big scare stories was affected um, pensioners was you'll lose your pensions. And, and that age group, well, it's our age group, that age group, um, you know, still not, still not convinced. So likely to be another scare issue. We might go to Scott Gover and, and say, look, just take the feet out from under that immediately by saying now that you will completely cover pay all Scots state pensions day one of independence. So uh, there are some figures behind that that actually, but you probably don't need that for the moment. So the issue analysis, and you said you got some figures, that's good, because the first thing you want to start with is you need to have warranty around your claim. So what is the reliable figure that shows that people were influenced by the pensions issue in 2014? show that it was a problem um, in order to create the solution that you think you, uh, needs to do with it. Now, the solution to their um, assuaging anybody about their pension fears uh, for independent Scotland might be quite wide and varied, and you might feel not that there's those to do that, but we know that was an issue, you know, here is, and even though it came out saying things like 5% of voters in that referendum said pension was the number one issue that stopped them voting yes. That's still, considering we're now in a fossilised 40-40 and a 20% in the middle bit, that 5% becomes key. Do we know as well whether that 5% was fossilised in, is now fossilised in no, in which case maybe we'll never answer this, but you want to know that because what you don't want is someone coming back to you saying like, nah, we're not going to end with you because they're no voters and they're never going to change, so we're never going to win on that issue. And that'll be really hard to kind of here, I would rather know the answer to that before I go into that kind of process. So I like to know what my, not just what I know, what I believe, but also how might it be countered. And I can know that now before I start to then work out how I'm going to uh, lobby. Because I need to be able to counter how people will oppose me as much as how I want to promote what I believe in. It's then going to come down to, as you said, an SMP Green Coalition government. Um, so that's two parties that you want to make sure they're influenced, plus a wider independence movement who, again, will influence into those two parties, but who also have a tremendous influence within the movement full stop. You know, the one thing that's very clear um, is Commonweal had a huge influence on the SNP manifesto for 2021. I mean, they were waving flags about how influential they had been. Um, and in the 2016 one, to a certain extent, but I don't think they were quite so clever on how they communicated how successful they'd been on that one. But 2021, they had a huge list of all their asks and they were ticking them off when they appeared in the SMP manifesto. Um, so we know that some groups within the independence movement have somehow have a little bit more influence than others. Now, there, there's a lot more that's happened since then in terms of where Commonweal, as directed by Robin, yeah. Where they now send, tend to be leaning, whether they've got the same clout, but you know, they're still seen as a large um, membership group um, with a kind of political ideology that is influential. <clears throat> so I would, I would be thinking about, okay, I, I would want to see if they're up, are they going to be on board with us? And maybe they've got a solution. Um, I'd want to understand how the Green Party works in terms of its policy making process, but also what's its views on pension and what's its thinking around that independence referendum. And the same with uh, SMP. Now in SMP, you've got different ways into it. You've got all your usual, as you probably um, appreciate this, that um, there's the whole kind of party uh, policy making process through a uh, party conference. But equally, you can go direct to the lead person on pensions in the Westminster group, find out where they're at, what influence are they, you know, what do they think? Um, do they support us? In fact, they may be a good person to bring into one of your next meetings um, because they don't have executive responsibility and a diary that's jam-packed through with going to things. And technically pensions is not a devolved, so there is no minister for pensions as such uh, in the Scottish government. So it is very much a Westminster reserve and it would be good to hear, because although the Westminster group, I mean, I should have said, 
It's part of the intro. I worked two days with Alan Smith now, so I'm not doing so much in the way of consultancy. Um, but I'm getting an insight now into how West, Westminster yeah. would be much more effectively. So I bring that into it. Um, and then I'd be looking at who in the Scottish ministers is taking responsibility for planning for the referendum. You obviously be clear that Mike Russell is the political director of the independence unit in the party, is a hugely influential person. And the, we also have a pool of civil servants who are working on this. So if any of your members hired civil servants, or, you know, have any connection to civil servants, then I would want to use them as well. One of the things I never said, actually, here's a phrase that was used to me one. If you're having to contact a minister, it's because you failed to convince the civil servants of your solution. That's, contacting a minister was a last resort um, lobbying tactic, tactic that essentially go through the policy, go through the civil service, get them on board because they control government more than ministers ever have done. So it sounds a bit yes ministry, but it is true. Um, and certainly in my experience in renewables, that's exactly what we did. We I knew all our, we knew our director general, we knew our directors, uh, deputy directors, policy managers, and we made sure that as many staff moved on into that civil service because embedded in there, and what's, one of the things my interest, sort of research interest is the embeddedness between civil service and interest groups in short life working groups. So ever a sticky, wicked, um, a kind of wicked issue, let's create a working group. And, you know, it's usually got a mix of external organisations representing different things. So if it's Scottish Peel Fog, the Fuel Poverty Forum, ministers, unless it's in a manifesto, the ministers are not really that interested in creating new policy on something that might be seen as being, uh, if you haven't got me a given, given me a clear solution, then... I haven't got the time to be looking for the solution. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can understand that sort of a normal, you know, parliamentary kind of, you know, situation. But do you think that's different given that, you know, they've now pretty well, you know, opened the starting gate on, on the referendum? Yeah, so my my thinking is that the, the, the team of civil servants will already have covered a lot of these issues. Right. But that doesn't mean to say they're going to come up with a solution that you're going to be happy with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, they are going to come up. One of their one of their papers, one of the papers that they're coming out with is is going to be about pensions, but of course we don't know what's in it yet. That's all really that's all really fascinating. Actually, hearing what you said there. Uh, thanks. It's great. So I was quite impressed with with Grant's very strategic, methodical approach there. And planning is obviously key to any kind of campaign. He's talking strategy. That's why I really enjoyed that that meeting. He's talking strategy. And, and you saw that coming out um, when I asked him, what about campaigning for pension? You know, he was just doing it off the cuff. And also no, no difficult stuff, really. And yeah. there's no magic yeah. in it. It's a simple... How do you communicate with people? How do you get your points across? And how do you plan how you're going to do it? In fact, that moves us on quite nicely to our next clip, which is Common Wheels, Leo Plum. Leo and I had a, a little run round their new campaign centre. When I say run round, it's a virtual run round because it's on their <laughs> website. We did a bit of a screen share and Leo talks us through the features of the campaign centre. So we're just going to play that now and encourage you, if you haven't already joined it, very easy, very quick to sign up. Go and have a look and see what you can learn from it. it it's got the potential, I think, to be a, a really yeah. valuable tool, although it's it's in its very early stages yeah. right now. So yeah. we'll play that next. Well, the campaign centre is relatively new. So for people that know Commonweal, we're a think and do tank, and as well as providing policy papers that we try and get influenced in the minds of politicians and political parties and other, other civil society groups, a big part of what we do is um, to try and build support through local people or people that are involved in campaigns at a local level. So Campaign Centre is, is basically a, an online space, a bit like a social media platform, where people can find like-minded or, or individuals with common views that they share and can join in and learn quite a lot of skills about campaigning or even get involved in campaigning from scratch, building a campaign or picking up on some of the ideas that Commonweal puts out and helping us to campaign on those, promote those, find new ways to get those out there. So it's a, a, a space that's usable in lots of different functions and is pretty new. 
just like all kind of social media platforms, I guess it gives people a chance to share information, links, pages, publications, articles, things that they've picked up on or found interesting. One important thing for us at Commonweal is that we want people to get involved and feel like they can campaign or discuss political ideas without it having to be linked to any particular party political position. Mm -hmm. So you'll find a lot of people talking here about very disparate or very different sets of issues facing Scotland at the moment. We have set it up so that as people join, they can introduce themselves and just say hello, and then be kind of put in touch with each other by their common interests. So a lot of people will join and just put up a few sentences about themselves, just saying what motivates them, what they want to see in, in, the, in the future in Scotland. And people can then begin to navigate and go a bit deeper. So if you've used it a few times before, or if you're completely new to it, I definitely recommend uh, one of the first things to do is to look at the courses that we have available. So we've just started a section on courses. These are brand new. In here, you've got the kind of learning particular skills. We've got a course up there, Learn How to Campaign, uh, that Robin McAlpine put together. Really nice videos that talk you through building a campaign from scratch. Oh, and eight different topics, yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of in-depth material within those as well. So you can build your way, your kind of knowledge through that. So we'll be uploading some videos to that shortly today. And then people can kind of become experts a little bit on certain aspects of the blueprint for a Green New Deal by learning in chunks. In the groups, we've got some active groups either where Commonweal have started them or where some of our supporters have started groups themselves. And that's what we really want to see. So we've got some people who've got a, a letter writing group there. We've got uh, a newly started group that just started yesterday um, in support of the strikes across Scotland. But in the future, we're going to have hopefully more and more materials for people to discover. You can see Consultation Club there. The consultation club that's there within Campaign Centre is just to promote a club that was started by one of our supporters where he's getting people to discuss certain consultations, look at what articles are useful to refer to and then encouraging people to complete them. There's loads of chances for people to start their own initiatives through Campaign Centre and that's what we at Commonwealth would really like. It's dead easy to use and we'll be on hand within that platform to talk people through um, how to use it as well. This is the final section of, of this month's programme. It's a bit like standing on the edge and looking into the abyss because we all remember what it felt like on the morning after the referendum and how gut-wrenching that was. Whatever we may think about some of the uh, ethics or, or strategies involved in the Better Together campaign, they won. There's no doubt about that. So listen to this and then we'll have a wee think about it afterwards. So what we did was we um, invested all of our money, all of our time, all of our resource, all of our energy in the early part of the campaign to try and find out what people actually thought. 30% of people, no matter what we said, no matter what we did, were going to vote yes. There was nothing we could do to change their minds. 40% of people were going to vote no. Nothing the yes campaign could say or do was going to change their mind. They were going to vote no. So the campaign then became about the 30% in the middle. And as a campaigner and as people who work in campaigns, uh, I implore you to always think about how your campaign can impact those people whose minds can be changed, particularly when it comes to politics. But we ran our entire campaign for the 30% in the middle, and that was why we won. So the 30% told us that they were going to make their decision based on risk and uncertainty, the risk and uncertainty of leaving the United Kingdom, Scotland leaving the United Kingdom, what does that mean? What will it mean to my pension? What will it mean to our schools? What will it mean to our health service? Um, but, crucially, they wanted something to vote for. So, the underlying issue was the risk and uncertainty, but the thing that was going to motivate them to vote was to have something to vote for. Um, so, once we understood that, it allowed us to start develop messaging. And the strategy that we used was to tell people what the problems were, what the issues were, but crucially to also tell them what the solution was. So here's the problem and here's the answer. And the reason that that was important was because people felt anxious. From our research, we understood that people felt anxious about making a decision of this magnitude. People knew how big a decision it was. And by telling them, don't worry, here's the answer, um, was very important because it made people feel much more comfortable about voting. Um, so the message that we, we, we got to um, was this. 
was I want the best of both worlds for Scotland. It positioned people as being Scottish. It positioned people as I care about Scotland. I want the best for Scotland's future. Uh, and, and it allowed us to talk about the things that we knew the voters wanted to hear, which were more powers for Scotland. That was the thing to vote for. If you vote no, you're going to get something. You're going to get more powers for the Scottish Parliament and the strength, security and stability of the UK. We used social media a lot. We used Twitter because of its uh, immediacy and because of the fact that everything breaks on Twitter. We used it to try and influence the conversation. So we used it to aggressively try and influence the campaign. And I'll give you an example of that in a moment. But Facebook we used differently. Facebook we used to, yes, influence the campaign, but to do it in a much slower way, to try and introduce themes and to try and introduce stories that we could, we could spread out over a longer period of time. Facebook was where the conversation ultimately was happening about the debate. Um, when we got to the last about three months of the campaign, and we were down to almost weekly and daily focus groups and polling, we kept on saying, where are you going to find the information that's going to allow you to make this decision. And it started off, it was always all the BBC uh, and the newspapers. And as we got closer and closer and closer, people were saying, Facebook, I'm going to get my opinion from Facebook. I'm going to get my opinion from speaking to people on Facebook, from my friends, from my family, from articles I see on Facebook. So we knew that, that actually the important thing for us to do was to try and influence that conversation uh, in a way that was slightly different from Twitter, where we were really aggressively going for it. Um, and we set up Twitter squads. You know, we had these people who were just tweeting aggressively, rebutting points, you know, just getting out there and showing how confident we were in our arguments. Um, so we had banks of people in our campaign headquarters that as soon as the leader of the Yes campaign said something, they were on it. You know, they were just, oh, that's rubbish, that's nonsense, and let me tell you why. Um, but we had another team who were working on Facebook that were using infographics, that were using real-life examples, that were using videos from real people, um, and we were posting both of them at the same time. So we were influencing the conversation on Facebook in an entirely different way from the way we were doing it on Twitter. You have to stay on track. You cannot allow yourself to deviate from the message, from what the research is telling you you have to do. So there we go. Now, that is just a tiny segment of, of the clip. And if you want to watch the full thing, it, it probably is useful to do so. Search for Rob Shorthouse on YouTube and you'll get him. I know you think he's very smug and a bit cocky in that uh, interview, but I, I suppose to be fair, maybe he deserves it. I mean, they did win. I didn't know whether to be aghast at all of that or to sort of, you know, I mean, it's a bit grudging, but you kind of have to be impressed as well because they got it together and they made it work. There's some bits of what he was saying that just reinforces things that we've been talking around this video already, like being really clear on yeah. what is the message. And the thing I liked was um, run the campaign that your data is telling you to run, not yeah. the one that's easy for you to run. Yeah. Um, and I think that's for the yes movement. We are often talking amongst ourselves. That is not the group we need to convince. That came across really strongly to me as well. Yeah. And, and then the other point that he made was there's a whole group of people you're never going to convince. There's no point in talking to them. You know, just go for those ones who are persuadable and finding them. And it's a smaller pool this time around. Yeah. I think, as you said, yeah. um, finding them is the key. And then, of course, the bit where um, the morality sort of flies out the window, in my opinion, is when they've got banks of paid yeah. Internet trolls working to undermine any kind of information that's out there. Those banks of, you know, tweeters that they, they, they had responding, yeah, you kind of have to be maybe grudgingly, you know, impressed because that, that was effective. Mm -hmm. That did manage to influence the debate. But I don't suppose those banks of people are, were Scottish and I don't suppose they had a vote. You know, they were just, they were just there doing a job. Let's finish the programme on a more positive note, although, you know, grudging respect to what they did, but we don't want a campaign like that. So no. there is a new set of information leaflets that have come out recently from Believe in Scotland. They've done a whole series of postcard sized leaflets, haven't they? I know you've been out and about. Going out this afternoon if the rain stops. <laughs> That's good. So they're all from Believe in Scotland. And um, I, I think um, I think there's one in particular that's very canny. It doesn't mention independence. It just talks about getting a decent pension for, for, for Scots. Whether you're in a yes group or Women for India or whatever, if you want to go out and do some leafleting or do some stalls, I believe in Scotland's website 
has got details of the new products and also obviously all the, the background information. You can order it from the website and it'll, it'll yeah. give you the details of how to do that. Just before we go, Fiona, shall we just also kind of tell people that that interview we did with Francis Curran, there's an extended version. That's going to be on our Indie Live Extra. Thanks for listening, everybody. As you probably know, because you've probably subscribed, we have a podcast out every Friday and occasionally an extra midweek as well. We also have a YouTube channel called Indie Live Extra, where you can see video clips of a lot of the material we cover in our podcast. Hope you found that useful. We'll catch you all next week. Bye now.